Um, there are lots of deeper problems and um, theorems that apply to partial derivatives, and I just want to go over a few of those now. In particular, I want to calculate some more complicated partial derivatives. Um, so let's look at a particular example. So uh, let's look at f of x, y equals x sine of x, y plus 3y to the fourth. And I just want to calculate the partial derivative of f with respect to x and with respect to y, or so the partial derivatives. So um, if you look at this and you wonder, you ought to be able to tell, or with some practice you ought to be able to tell, which partial derivative would be more complicated? And the answer is the, the one with respect to x is going to be slightly more complicated because here's the product of two functions of x. The one with respect to y won't be quite as bad because x is a constant as far as y is concerned, so you won't have to do the product rule here. But uh, it's not as though either one of them is particularly painful. Um, but let's do the partial derivative of f with respect to y first. So the x is a constant. You get the derivative of sine is cosine. The x times y stays exactly how it was inside, but by the, the one variable chain rule, you have to multiply it times the derivative of the inside stuff with respect to y. And the derivative of this with respect to y is just x. Um, all right. And then you get a plus in the derivative of this part with respect to y. You get a 12y cubed. Okay, so that wasn't bad. Uh, for aesthetic beauty, of course, you could move this x over here with this x and write x squared, but you don't. Regard, do what you want. The partial derivative with respect to x, as I said, is going to be a little worse. You need, so here, here are two functions of x. Of course, at least this part's easier. Partial derivative of this part with respect to x is zero. Partial derivative of this part with respect to x, you'd have to do the product rule. Here's a function of x, here's a function of x. It's the first thing times the derivative of the second part. So you get the cosine of xy. And by the chain rule, you have to multiply times the derivative of the stuff inside with respect to x. So you pick up a y. But then by the product rule. So that was the first thing times the derivative of the second. Now we have to do the second thing times the derivative of the first. The derivative of x with respect to x is just 1 and then times the sine of xy. So that's it. That's what you get. We had to use uh, the chain rule, the product rule, the power rule. Uh, we had to know the derivatives of sine and cosine. The you know, partial derivatives just take some getting used to, pretending that other variables are constant. All right, let's, um, let's look at a, a word problem, not a particularly bad word problem but one that uses something you've probably heard about, the ideal gas law. So the ideal gas law has to do with a gas that behaves kind of like a normal gas, an ideal gas, that's um, in, a, in a container that has variable size, so something like a balloon or maybe a piston or something, so that the, the volume of the container can vary during the problem. So that, and then the ideal gas law says that the pressure that the gas exerts on the container times the volume is some constant times the temperature where the pressure is measured in newtons per square meter, that's pascals, so pascals. The volume's in cubic meters. The temperature is in kelvins. We don't say degrees kelvin anymore, just kelvins. And K then needs to be in, actually we're going to assume, all right, let me, this is the pressure, this is the volume, this is a constant, this is the temperature. This constant has to do with the number of atoms or molecules of the gas and the ideal gas constant. We're going to assume uh, or a fairly reasonable value for K of 8 newton meters per kilogram, uh, per degree Kelvin. Um, ah, per Kelvin, not degree Kelvin. Uh, all right, um, great. 
So this relationship is experimentally satisfied or approximately satisfied, but we're going to assume it's exactly right. And the problem I want, the question I want, this is just a basic partial derivative question, but let's just get used to it. If the temperature is held at 320 kelvins, what is the instantaneous rate of change instantaneous rate of change of the pressure with respect to the volume when the volume is two cubic meters. All right, well, that took a lot of writing. <laughs> the, answer, the answer will be much, much shorter than actually writing out the problem that's um, that's frequently the case with word problems. <laughs> the answer, the math that you have to write for the answer is shorter than the statement of the problem. Uh, mathematical symbols encode a lot of words. So, what, what are we being asked for and how do we calculate it? Well, uh, the instantaneous rate of change of the pressure with respect to the volume when you're keeping the temperature constant. So, we're going to rewrite the ideal gas law as K. We're going to divide both sides by V. So we're writing P as a function, K as a constant. P is a function of T and V. And what we're being asked for is exactly the instantaneous rate of change of P with respect to V when the temperature is held constant. Well, that's a partial derivative. We're being asked, what's the partial derivative of P with respect to V when, well, we're holding the, the temperature constant at 300 and, at 320 kelvins, and we want this when the volume is 2 cubic meters. Um, and we also know that K, in fact, I could write that down here, we also know that K is 8. We're assuming that. But... So what do we get? The partial derivative of this with respect to V is easy. The K is a real constant, <laughs> a constant constant. When we're taking partial derivatives, we're, um, we're holding the temperature constant. In fact, we said the temperature was constant physically. So you just get K times T, and then it's just the derivative of this with respect to V. So it's just the power rule minus V to the minus 2. Um, and then you plug in what everything is. So this is minus kt over v squared, and so you just get minus 8 times 320 divided by the volume squared, which is 2 squared. So uh, this is what you get. I mean, 2 squared is 4. Divide that into 8, you get 2 minus 2 minus 640 units, well, the units are these units divided by, by these units, pascals per cubic meter. All right, uh, you might wonder, does that make sense? The, we, um, we asked for how the pressure is changing as a function of the volume when the volume is 2 cubic meters, and we got something negative. That would mean that when the 
the volume goes up, the pressure goes down. Well, yeah, that's intuitively that hopefully seems right. At least the sign seems right. When the, the volume goes up, the pressure goes down. Um, all right, uh, that was the example I want to do. Um, another example of partial derivatives, I'd like to use our gradient and our notion of the gradient vector and calculate something, a quantity that will be of interest to us in later sections. Another example, this is a, not a word problem. It is, suppose, g of xy is x e to the y plus y squared times the inverse tangent of x. And the question I want to answer is, what is the gradient vector of g at 1, 1 dotted with the vector 2 minus 2? So we want to calculate this. Um, all right. Well, this is, you should just think of this as practice with, with the gradient vector notation and recalling what dot product is. And seriously, we will look at lots of quantities like this in later sections. So what do you do? Well, the gradient vector is the vector form from the partial derivatives. So of course, you have to calculate the partial derivatives of g with respect to x and with respect to y. So we'll do that. The partial of g, actually let me rewrite g over here so I don't have to keep referring back to the other board, x e to the y plus y squared inverse tangent of x. All right. Then the partial of g with respect to x is e to the y, so right, the, the y is a constant as far as x is concerned, so e to the y is a constant, this is just x times a constant, so it's partial derivative with respect to x, e to the y, partial derivative of this part with respect to x, the y squared is a constant, and then you multiply times the derivative of the inverse tan of x with respect to x, so that's 1 over 1 plus x squared. The partial derivative of g with respect to y, then the x is a constant, so this is constant, derivative e to the y is e to the y. The partial derivative of this part with respect to y, the inverse tan of x is a constant, the partial derivative of y squared with respect to y, 2y. So you get 2y inverse tan of x. So we need these. We want the gradient vector calculated at 1, 1. So we need these partial derivatives when x and y are both 1. <coughs> writing that little vertical evaluation line. All right, so we plug in x is 1 and y is 1, so we get e to the 1, e, and then we get plus, um, so that's 1 uh, over 1 plus 1, so we get e plus a half. Here you get 1 times e to the 1, so we get e again, and then Plug in x and y is 1, so you get 2 plus 2 times. And then you have to know the inverse tangent of 1. Well, you should think that's where we want the tangent to be 1. And we need an angle between minus pi over 2 and pi over 2. Tan is 1. That means sine equals cosine. You should think, ah, 45 degrees, but we need it in radians. So pi over 4, 2 times pi over 4. So here we get e plus pi over 2. So what's the gradient vector of g at 1, 1 dotted with 2 minus 2? We get e plus a half comma e plus pi over 2 dotted with 2 minus 2. And so you get 2e, so 2 times this, so 2e plus 1, and then minus 2e, minus 2e minus pi. 
The 2e is canceled. There's a plus 2e and a minus 2e, so we're left with 1 minus pi. Okay, that was, that was some minimal practice with the gradient vector. Um, I need to say something about functions of more than two or three variables. I mean, maybe it's obvious, but you can take partial derivatives of functions of any number of variables. So, so if you've got some function of n variables, so x1, x2, xn, well, there's no reason you need to stop at 3. And of course, then you just have the partial derivative of f with respect to any of the xi's. Um, you could also write this as f sub xi. Some people write f sub i. I'll try not to use that notation because I like, when I have a multi-component function, I like to write f sub i for the ith component function. Um, the rigorous definition of the partial derivative, which won't surprise you, it means you keep all the other variables fixed except xi, and you look at the instantaneous rate of change of that. So it would mean that you take f of x1, x2 out to, well, wherever xi is, and you add h to that one, and then you just keep, and then take the rest of your x's and subtract x1, x2, just just with an xi there. So all it means is you take an instant, uh, a tiny, I think h is small, a small change in the ith coordinate, the ith component, and you divide by h. One nice way of writing this that will be relevant to us later is that this is limited as h approaches 0 of, well, this is just f of x plus, you've added the vector that's all zeros except in the ith component has an h. Well, that's h times the standard basis vector, um, e sub i. I have some problem now. I'm underlining multi-component um, variables. Of course, I think of this as a vector, so I'm tempted to put a little arrow over it, but um, we'll try to stick with the underlining to indicate bold and to just try to indicate that sometimes we think of these things as points and sometimes as, as vectors, um, all divided by h. So that's the rigorous definition of the partial derivative. And of course, you can, I mean, as I presented it, you can do this with any number of variables. Let's look at an example with um, lots of variables and a, another word problem, another well, I guess the other one was, I don't know if you think of it as chemistry or physics, but in this one, we're definitely going to look at some electricity. So I guess this is really physics. So let's look at an example. So um, If you have a bunch of resistors, so resistors resist the flow of current, if you have a bunch of resistors, you can form a new resistor um, by putting them in parallel. So actually, let me draw a bigger, a bigger. So if you have a bunch of resistors, but maybe not one of, with the resistance that you want, you can form a new kind of complicated resistor. This is the little, <laughs> actually, that's a very bad one. This is supposed to, this is how electrical engineers denote resistors, more or less, except this is a very bad picture. They put a little jagged thing here. So you've got some resistor here and some resistor here, and you've got more resistors maybe in between. And down here, you've got 
R sub n, so n resistors, these are said to be resistors in parallel. resistance R sub i ohms. And the big deal is, so if you put these resistors in parallel like this, then you can think of this, this, these connections here that are loose as this whole thing is one complicated new resistor. And the answer, uh, the answer, the question is, What's the resistance of this new resistor? If you think of it as one resistor, well, um, it's determined by, so the, the new resistance, one over it, is the sum of the reciprocals of the original resistances. Now, I'm not going to derive that for you, but I want, I want to look at, okay, so if this is how the resistance of this new resistor depends on the resistances of the other ones, what's the instantaneous rate of change of the resistance of this new complex resistor in terms of the resistances of one of the resistors in the circuit? Um, and we could take reciprocals of both sides. Another way to write this is that R nu is R1 to the minus 1 plus R2 to the minus 2 plus Rn to the minus 1, and then I took a reciprocal of this side, so to the minus 1. So this is um, explicitly what R nu is, is a function of the, of the original resistors, resistances. Um, don't do bad, really bad algebra here. If you, I don't know, if you got carried away, you'll go, ah, I've got a, a sum of things all raised to the minus 1, then I raise that to the minus 1, and it wipes out all these minus 1s, I just get R nu is the sum of the R1 plus R2 plus da 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 plus Rn. That is false. You can't just take reciprocals of sums by taking reciprocals of each sum in. So, no, you can't really simplify that any. And so, my question is what's, if you leave all the other resistors alone but change one of the resistances in the original, in the original, uh, one of the original resistances, how does that? What's the instantaneous rate of change of our new complicated resistor? Well, yeah, there are a lot of variables here. And we took, we're taking a partial derivative with respect to an arbitrary one, but that's no big deal. So what do you get? So we've got R nu is R1 to the minus 1 plus, oh, plus R2 to the minus 1 plus Rn to the minus 1 to the minus 1. And so then it's fairly easy. What's the partial derivative of R nu with respect to Ri? All right, well, you take the derivative of this quantity using the power rule and the chain rule, you get minus R1 to the minus 1 plus R2 to the minus 1 plus, plus Rn to the minus 1 to the minus 2. But then by the power rule, you have to differentiate the stuff inside with respect to R1. But all of those, none of those depend on R1 except the, uh, the R1, Ri, except Ri raised to the minus 1. So you will take the deriv you will multiply times the derivative of Ri to the minus 1, which is a minus Ri to the minus 2. Right? For instance, if I is 2, we would be taking partial derivatives with respect to R2. We'd get this, and then the partial derivative of all this stuff with respect to R2, well, partial derivative of that with respect to R2, 0, partial derivative of that with respect to R2, 0, all we get is minus r2 to the minus 2. So you get that. Um, you can cancel these minus signs. There's a minus sign there and a minus sign there. Those cancel. Um, and so those are gone. This quantity, 
is exactly that, except this was raised to the minus 1, this to the minus 2. Oh, so this part is r nu squared. So I'm canceling these minus signs, but then this part is r nu squared. Right? This thing squared would just multiply that minus 1 by 2. So that's this part. I cancel that minus sign with that one times ri to the minus 2. And if we want to write this more neatly, this is r nu squared divided by r i squared, or what's the same thing? r nu divided by r i quantity squared. So that's the nice, cool formula that you get. Um, before I leave this example, I would like to calculate it in another way that won't look, it may not look substantially easier, but in other problems this kind of technique could be. Um, and that is, I'd like to go back to this formula, but never take the reciprocal of this side. So this formula, but I will rewrite things in terms of powers, says says this, and what I want to do now is implicit differentiation, the way you would have done it in single variable calculus. Now you have to be a little careful. We're now taking partial derivatives, and usually I say you keep all the other independent variables constant. And one of the reasons I keep saying independent variables is I'm about to take the partial derivatives of both sides of this equation with respect to ri. And the other independent variables are r1, r2, all the r's over here other than ri. But r nu is not independent of ri. It depends on ri. So it is not, I won't just think of this as a new independent variable and its partial derivative with respect to ri is zero. No. When you take partial derivatives, it's you hold all the other independent variables constants. It's important that you realize r nu is not independent of ri. So, but, with that warning, you do hit both sides of this with a partial derivative with respect to ri. And what do you get? Over here, you get by the power rule, you get minus r nu to the minus 2, but then times the derivative of the inside stuff. So times the partial derivative of r nu with respect to ri. That's what we're after. And over here, what do you get? Well, the only one of these that depends on ri would be ri to the minus 1, and you would get minus ri to the minus 2. So you get this. The point of this is that by implicit differentiating, implicitly differentiating, we never had to solve algebraically for r nu. Now, of course, it's easy to solve algebraically for r nu here, so what's the big deal? In other problems, it might not be easy. And so, yeah, implicit differentiation is very useful at times. Of course, this answer matches what we got before. You can cancel the minus sign on both sides. Um, ah, well. Well, it would match what I had before. If I had done this partial derivative correctly, that should be a minus 2. You get a minus ri to the minus 2. Now, oh, you get this. Now the minus signs cancel. And then you divide both sides by this, which means you end up with an r nu squared over here. And of course, you end up with the same thing we got before once I fixed my stupid chalkographical error. So we get r nu over ri squared. Okay. Um, that's the end of that example. I now want that I realize this in-depth part is just a bunch of little things, but I, I need to, I want to state a theorem for you that should look like a theorem you remember from single variable calculus. Then I need to say a few things um, more about uh, higher, about mixed partial derivatives. And then we'll stop. 
So um, in single variable calculus, you have the result that if two functions have the same derivative, they differ by a constant. And that's the basis for being able to produce antiderivatives, because you find one, and then every other antiderivative must be that one plus some constant. The same thing is true here, except you have to be careful about, well, you have to be careful, careful about how you remember the theorem from calculus one. What it really says is if you're on an open interval and two functions have the same derivative on that open interval, then there's a constant um, so that one function equals the other function plus that constant. We need a multivariable version of an open interval, and that is, so suppose u is a non-empty, so we want there to be some points in it, a non-empty connected, <clears throat> So that really means it's not in pieces, connected, open, subset of Rn. So you should picture this as, I'm putting dotted lines to indicate the points on the boundary are not there, but just some, some shape that's connected. It's not in pieces, so this would be the set U. Um, okay, uh, suppose you, um, if F and G, so uh, these are functions in, in variables, so are such that all of their partial derivatives agree at every point of view. Uh, one quick way of saying that, such that is, we could say such that the gradient of f at p equals the gradient of g at p for all p and u. So that's the same as saying all the partial derivatives are the same for all p and u. And in particular, I'm saying that these exist. By saying they're equal, they're something that exists there. So the partial derivatives are defined and they're equal for all p and u. Um, then, f differs from g. by a constant. Right, what you usually say is f is g plus some big constant. Um, you know, you need to be a little careful when you say it like this because that's true for points in the set u, but if you look at some other set where possibly f and g are also defined, it might not be they might not differ by a constant there. Um, right. So the statement is there exists a constant C such that for all P in U, F of P equals G of P plus that constant. So you shouldn't memorize this theorem except as, I mean, we should remember it without having to memorize it. It's, you should think of it as completely analogous to the one variable statement. If two functions have the same derivative on an open interval, then those functions differ by a constant. This says if two multivariable functions have the same partial derivatives on a connected open set, so non-empty connected open set, well, you could leave out non-empty, but then the conclusion would be stupid that they're equal at every point in an empty set. Well, eh. Anyway, <laughs> on, an, on a connected open if two multivariable functions have all the same partial derivatives, on a connected open set, then the two functions differed by a constant. So hopefully that will be easy for you to remember. Um, we talked about, we looked at some second partial derivatives and the mixed partials. And 
you can have, you can take more partial derivatives, and of course you can have functions of any number of variables. So um, it's, uh, <laughs> it can get kind of ugly. You know, if you had f, and f is a function of w, x, y, and z, well, you could ask about you know, third derivatives, you know, or fifth derivatives. Let's look at what's the, what's the fifth derivative of f, uh, first with respect to w, and then with respect to x twice, and maybe with respect to uh, z, and then with respect to y. Well, yuck. Is that five times? One, two, three, four, five. Yeah, that number matches the total number of partial derivatives down here. So that's a mixed fifth order partial derivative. So this is, we call this a higher order partial derivative. Now, and you could take 137th partial derivative and you'd have to specify the order in which you take the partial derivatives with respect to the various variables. Yuck, yuck. But there is a theorem that, that tells you when the order in which you take the partial derivatives doesn't matter. Uh, it won't, it doesn't mean, <laughs> it does matter how many times you took the partial derivative with respect to each variable. Like here it's w once, x twice, and then a y and a z once. So, but what the theorem does say is that under the right conditions, you, it didn't matter what order you did these in. You could have taken the partial derivative with respect to y first, and, um, then with respect to w, then with respect to x, then with respect to z, and then with respect to x. It doesn't matter. When doesn't it matter? All right, let me make some definitions. So we say, um, so definition. So suppose I've got f is a function of any number of variables, then f is r times continuously differentiable, continue, continuously differentiable, if and only if. Ah, or we also say of class CR. The C is for continuously differentiable and the R is for R times. R times continuously differentiable. If and only if, so this is the definition, all of the partial derivatives of F of order less than or equal to r exist and are continuous. Um, so uh, this, this is a, a fifth order partial derivative said that, but so we need, you know, what does it mean for a function to be four times continuously differentiable? We mean you take any possible fourth order partial derivative and all of them are continuous. Uh, they exist and are continuous. Um, we also do this when r is not a finite number. So if, if, um, let me go in a stunningly bad piece of board organization. Let me go up the board. So, if F is CR, is of class CR, we sometimes just say is CR, 
is of class CR for all R, then F is said to be of class C infinity and is called infinitely, continuously, differentiable or simply this is what we usually say or smooth. <laughs> When we say a function is smooth, it may seem silly to you to call a function smooth. You picture a graph as being smooth. This is the, the standard terminology. Uh, C infinity function is just called smooth. So smooth means all the partial derivatives of all orders exist and are continuous. Uh, C infinity functions are what we care about most in this course. We, we're interested in where we can take as many derivatives as we want and we get continuous functions. So what's the theorem? The, the theorem I want to end with if f is of class CR, where, where R may be infinity. Well, actually, let me just leave it. If F is of class CR, then the order in which you take partial derivatives up to order R, doesn't matter. Of course, I'm stating this in a very colloquial way, but me, I said I would end with this, but it, just to make it completely clear what I'm saying, it's, there's an example, specific example I want to look at. I am not actually going to calculate these partial derivatives in the different orders, or even in one order, but um, just so you'll know what kind of thing I'm talking about, suppose f is x to the fifth, y to the sixth, z to the seventh, plus x e to the y z, plus y squared sine of 3x minus 5z. All the functions that are involved in this are as differentiable as we want them to be in one variable, and so this function is smooth. Right? It's a, this part's a polynomial. This is just an x times e to something. All the derivatives of this will exist and be continuous everywhere. It's um, right. So <clears throat> what's, what's the content of the theorem then? The theorem says that <clears throat> If you take the fourth derivative of f, the fourth partial derivative of f, and then, so really, if you remember the order that the notation goes in, this means first you do it twice with respect to x, then once with respect to y, and then once with respect to z. That's the same as, and the point is, it doesn't matter. As long as you take two derivatives with respect to x, one with respect to y, and one with respect to z, it doesn't matter what the order is. So you could just move those around if it was seem nicer to you, you could take the partial derivative with respect to y first, uh, then a partial derivative with respect to x, then a partial derivative with respect to z, and then a partial derivative with respect to x. As long as you do x twice and y and z once, you're going to get the same thing you get over here from doing x twice and y and z once. The order doesn't matter once you know that all your partial derivatives are, exist and are continuous. 
Um, all right. Well, I've uh, now by adding this more depth part, I've said a lot more about um, partial derivatives. Even though partial derivatives seem like such an easy topic, it's you can make anything complicated if you try hard enough. I've actually left out two or three complicated examples from the section, but I'll let you work on those on your own.